that would be the perfect song for it. It took 27 years. And so, anyway, <laughs> thank you. I love that song. It's a beautiful song. It is a beautiful song. It's a powerful song. So, wow, you know, it's just if you're patient and you just persist. 27. Because you, you only got one shot every year. So if you remember it too late, wait till next year. Anyway, hear the word of God from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe, Thomas said to him. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. All right, so many of you know that dogs are a big deal in House Buchanan, right? We have dogs. I would at times be tempted to give some of them away, but, but it's kind of like your children. You might feel the same way about your children at times, but you, you, you don't. You keep them. Right? And when you have a house full of dogs, when they hear the word treats, it's the best time of the day. It doesn't matter what they're doing or not doing. Now, we have one dog that can spell. That's the chocolate lab. Because usually, you know, when we say, you think it's time to, you know, Amy, do you think it's time that we should F-E-E-D? <laughs> the other dogs are still this, but... You say the word, you spell the word treats, Zeeland's already on it. Now, so I walk into the kitchen and I go for where the bag is. You know that rattling noise? I've got all, all of them there, full attention, all very much alert. And Zeeland is, you know, very vocal. She likes to share what's on her mind. So she starts barking, and, and this is so funny. Zeeland, where are you supposed to be? Where are you supposed to be? And you see her turning about face, turn her legs are going everywhere, and she runs to her kennel and sits down. All the dogs go to their places at the kennels as they're ready to receive the treats, except for one. It's the Chihuahua. <laughs> His name is Sparky. Sparky will not go into the kennel until you show him the treat, and then you guide the treat over to where the kennel is. And then he'll walk in. So we all concluded that Sparky is from Missouri, the show me state, because he will not go in that kennel unless you show him the treat you're going to give him. Show me. <laughs> Evidently, Thomas was from Missouri as well. Jesus appears to the disciples, the post-resurrection story, and the doors were locked for the disciples were afraid for their lives, that the same thing would happen to them and happen to Jesus. What I find beautiful in this story of the Gospel of John is that in spite of all the ways that they had locked themselves in, God finds a way to stand in their midst. 
That's the way spirit works, you see. Spirit's, spirit is not limited by latches and doors and locks. In fact, it's not even limited uh, to the fact that we as human beings find ways to build fortresses around ourselves, protect our, our feelings and our, and, our, and our mind. Spirit has a way of coming in when we least expect it. After Jesus appears to his disciples, he says, peace to you. And what we've noticed is that Jesus did not greet his disciples with peace be to you until after the post-resurrection stories. Okay? And then he showed them his scars and then says that he breathed on them. Pneuma, breath, wind, spirit. So he gave them the Holy Spirit. Well, this was, was amazing. And the disciples found a way to get outside of their house and go find Thomas. They said, we've seen the Lord. Thomas's response was, I'll not believe it until I've put my fingers in his nail scars and put my hand into the scar on his side. I won't believe it. A week later, they're all in the room together. Everything is still locked up. Jesus appears and he directly goes to Thomas and says, Thomas, put your finger here. Put your hand there. Now, Thomas didn't need to do this. He fell to his knees and he exclaimed, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus' response to Thomas was, Thomas, do you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who believe and who have not seen. That would be you and me. That would be you and me. Now, When we turn on local news, we have one particular station that is called what? Eyewitness News, right? Eyewitness. And in court of law, having an eyewitness to a crime is very helpful. <clears throat> in fact, if there's an eyewitness that saw you doing something, then chances are you're going to get busted. However, what we've discovered is that sometimes eyewitnesses are not as reliable as what one would like them to be, right? Five people see a car accident, five people tell a story, and not one of them is the same. Lawyers have discovered that with eyewitnesses, oftentimes they have talked to each other before they are pulled away separately to discuss what they saw, and so they've collaborated, right? Well, I didn't really see that, but if that person saw that, then it must be true. A lot of people have been sent to prison for eyewitness testimony. But here's the thing. It's not always accurate. What we have discovered in recent years is DNA. Right? If your DNA is there, you were there. <laughs> DNA does not lie. But a lot of people have been taken, put, taken out of prison and taken off death row because the DNA evidence showed it was not them, right? DNA does not lie. So, I think Thomas is getting a bad rap. I really do. Whenever someone is, you know, not following the program, when someone's questioning the, you know, the process or the procedure, we usually say, don't be a what? Doubting, okay, let's try that again. Don't be a what? Uh, Doubting Thomas. Yeah. Poor Thomas. What it's kind of suggesting when we interpret this passage that way is that you should have believed the eyewitness testimony, Thomas. Shame on you. But I admire Thomas. I admire him. I think I'm a lot like him. I kind of appreciate the fact that he just didn't blindly believe what he was told. He had to see it for himself. He had to see it for himself. Look, I grew up in a religious tradition where you were supposed to blindly believe everything the preacher said. Why is that? Well, because the preacher said 
that what he's saying is not him, but God speaking. So for you to doubt what the preacher is saying is for you not to be doubting the preacher, but doubting whom? And if you grow up in one of these traditions, you know what God does to people who doubt God, right? A lot of smoking going on, right? Plagues falling on people. You know, just horrible things happen for people who don't. So we all fly right. We're all of one mind, but not necessarily a good mind. But what I discovered is that even though I grew up in a tradition where we followed blindly what the preacher said, so when I got to seminary and I started hearing other words from other people, and I started reading words from scholars and people who had studied the Gospels and the Bible and the Old Testament scriptures and New Testament, who had studied the history, people who had spent their lifetime studying the scholarship. I discovered that their words were inconsistent with the words that I were told were only God's words. And what I discovered was that the pastor who had the exclusive words when I was growing up was holding out on me. He was holding out on us. He did not give us everything. He was educated. Doctorate in ministry. He was holding out on us. So I am thankful that, first of all, I got by, past the whole thing of what he said is God's word. That I could think for myself and not get smote. That's like the, that's the first thing, right? Think God gave you a brain. Now, for those of you who are new to us, you've probably not heard me say this, but I've said this at least once or twice a year for 27, almost 27 years. Don't believe everything I say. Don't take everything I say hook, line, and sinker. You have your own brain. You have your own mind. You have your own soul. If you think differently, that's okay. I know pretty near everything. I don't know everything, all right? I only have a master's degree. If I, got a, if I got a doctorate in ministry, then I would know everything, all right? Or if I were 20, I would know everything. <laughs> um, but when you hear me teach and when you hear me preach, you'll often hear me qualify, okay? This is how I see this. This is how this story has affected me. This is how this particular passage has informed my spirit. And the reason I do that is because the way that God speaks to me is not necessarily the way that God's going to speak to you. There are some people who can just follow and just believe blindly. There are others of us who want to do the research, who want to ask the question, who continue, continue to look at the sources. I was talking to some colleagues the other day, or a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about sermons and the post-worship sermon commentary, right? Now, what happens every, sometimes is that I'll see you at, at church or some other place, and you say, you know, a few months ago, you preached a sermon about blah, 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 blah. I just want you to know, when I heard you say thus and such, thus and such, thus and such, and thus and such, it really opened my mind, and it's, it became a catalyst for a lot of change. And I'm looking at you and nodding and going, wonderful. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't recall ever saying any of that. <laughs> what is happening? What is happening is that when I speak, or anyone else who speaks for that matter, as we're sharing our words, as we're sharing our experience, it triggers something in your psyche, Greek word for soul. It triggers something in you. So you hear what your soul needs to hear in that moment in time. Does that make sense? Because sometimes what you hear is not what I said, but in my mind, I'm glad that you heard it, something. But maybe what you heard is what your soul was informing you to hear. So it's like sometimes when I'm preaching, my words help you to make a connection that you did not have before. I know that wonderful teachers and preachers in my experience and my growing up, that's what they have done for me. They will share a story, they'll share a concept, to share an idea, then my mind kind of wanders off on this lovely little, you know, adventure. 
and then eventually I come back. But it's like, oh, okay. I may have missed a lot of this stuff in between. But my, my point is, is that my words are not God's words. I don't want to be a God. I have no desire. There's way too much responsibility and pressure on being a God. I have no desire to be a God. But my words are authentically mine. And they come from an authentic experience. And I believe that's why so many of you trust what I say because not so much the content but the authenticity. So my hope is that when I share these words that it triggers something inside of you that helps you along on your spiritual journey because some of us can take things blindly. Some of us can see a concept immediately. Others of us need proof. Others of us need to do some research. Others of us need to, to, to think about it for a while. And that's the way the Spirit works. Because the Spirit works for, to, for me in a specific way, I should not assume that the Spirit works the same for you. That, that's one of the problems that I have with rules-based religions in general. Is that, okay, here are the world rules to salvation. Everybody must have salvation in this exact way. Here are the rules of being a good father or a good mother. Everybody must be a good father and a good mother in this way. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't because spirit is not contained. Spirit is not locked in a room or locked out. When Jesus gave us spirit, he awakened our conscious mind to that which I believe always has been inside of us. When I was learning to be a counselor, it's fascinating how people can describe their phobias or the ways they're sabotaging their lives. And it's like going to the doctor and saying, you know, your sinuses are all stuffed and, you're, and they're swollen and you're coughing and your ears itch and your eyes are watery and, you know, your, your voice goes down a couple of octaves and you're blowing your nose constantly, those are symptoms of a what? A cold, yeah. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You, you don't have to have, you know, 20 years of med school to figure that out, right? It's a cold, because it's symptoms of a cold. It's the same when people start listing their behaviors, right? These are the things that I've done, these are the things that have happened to me, and in my mind as a counselor, I think, oh, okay, that's consistent with. And sometimes people think, oh my God, you know my life. How do you know my life? You know, I don't answer that question because that kind of magic kind of thing kind of helps you in the process of doing the counseling. <laughs> Let them think that I can see everything, all right? That's all right. But know what it is, it's symptomatic. And so as a counselor, even though the counselor can see what the problem is, and here are the things to help this person to overcome this problem, the counselor has to wait for the client to what? Figure it out for themselves. Dr. Phil, you know Dr. Phil? It's amazing what he can do in 40 minutes on television. Well, there's someone who's got a lifetime of issues. What you need to do, <laughs> we call that tell therapy. He can do that on TV, it might stick but chances are it will not. For when an individual discovers for themselves, oh my God, that is why I do what I do. It heightens consciousness and it heightens their ability to create change because they have discovered it for themselves. I find that the same is true for the spiritual journey. I can tell you how to believe. I could tell you what to believe. I could tell you exactly what God wants you to do and what God wants you to be and how God wants you to go about walking upon this earth. I could tell you those things. I don't for two reasons. First of all, I don't know. <clears throat> Second of all, I know that you need to see it for yourself. If you find your soul is locked in a room and you're wondering who am I and what does God want to do with my life? What am I to do with my life? Well, how am I to use what I have? But your room is locked. Don't be surprised when you get a visit and you hear the visitor say, peace, 
peace, and I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. <sighs> this is going to be a little hard to, to share, but I'm going to forge forward. You who have been around with me for a long time have heard me refer to a gentleman named Ken Allison over the years. He was my supervisor and a mentor when I was working at the Center for Drug-Free Living to help men with alcohol and drug addiction issues. And that two years with Ken Allison, just he gave me incredible tools and he set my life on a path that, that has benefited me and you for a long, long time. And I discovered uh, that he died recently. He died in January and uh, I, my heart breaks, but I think, what a wonderful human being he was on this planet and what he did for people. But as I was learning how to be a counselor with his supervision, I'd say, but Ken, what about this and how do I know? He said, just trust the process. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I don't need to trust. I don't know what process to trust. So throw, throw me a bone here. Ken, help me out here. Don't worry about it. Just trust the process. Say, Ken, but I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm concerned I'm going to screw up somehow. I don't want to make a mistake that causes them to relapse. You don't have the power to do that. If they choose to relapse, it's on them. Just trust the process. What, what does the process look like, Ken? How do I know when I'm on the process? Just trust the process. And I'd go to my colleagues who had been working with him a long time, and they had discovered the process themselves. And I would ask them. What's the process? You can't really describe it. I'm, I need the process now so I can get on with my life. And then about two months later, as I was leading a group, all of a sudden, it's like everything that I had been learning, everything that he had taught and coached us, my, it's everything just seemed to fall into place. And I was in a flow. And immediately I thought, ah. Oh, I just discovered the process. Trust the process. It's in the act of being the human being God created you to be that you discover the flow of life, that you discover spirit, that you discover the process. And the more you discover, the more you are enlightened about what is going on around you. C.S. Lewis once said, He believed in Christianity just like he believed in the sun, S-U-N. Not only because I see it, he said, but because by it I see everything else. Yeah, that's what we call it enlightenment. As we get rid of the locked doors and windows and the fortresses we build around ourselves, the prisons, the tombs, as we take that risk to allow the process of spirit to work in us and through us, and as we start becoming more conscious of how God is in our lives and the world around us, then we become more aware of it. Have you ever noticed that you never notice burgundy colored cars until you bought one? Oh my God, they're everywhere. White SUVs. I believe everybody in Florida has one. You know how hard it is to find our car at Target? It's once we become conscious of something, we see it everywhere. And then that leads us to something else, which leads us to something else, which leads us to something else. Whether you believe from faith or you need empirical evidence, Christ still appears to you. There are no specific ways. There's not only one way God can connect. Whoever, God meets us where we are. And it's a matter of our opening ourselves up to allow the Spirit to teach us. And also, Jesus said, Thomas, do you believe because you've seen signs and miracles? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Look. The spiritual journey, the spiritual process, the, part, the, part, the process of, of awakening, the process of becoming more one with God's Spirit is not an external thing. Something externally can, can be the catalyst for us to do what? To look inwardly. 
just as therapeutic counseling creates healing when the when the the client starts looking inwardly so in the spiritual life as well peace be to you peace be upon you and it's that peace right it's that peace and peace in in this sense is not an absence of chaos peace is a, a way of being I find that my peace comes from a sense of knowing a sense of experiencing and I'm not going to stand before you today on this Sunday morning and say, because I've got Jesus in my heart and because I've been on this journey for a long, long time, I never stress, I never am afraid of it. That's, that's, that wouldn't be a big fat lie. I'm just like all the rest of you. When I know that something's going on and I can't see the outcome yet, I stress just like you do. And sometimes the stress is overwhelming. And you know what happens for me when that happens? is that that spirit of peace reminds me it's that little voice inside my head that still small voice that says trust the process Burton <laughs> trust the process you don't know the answers now but trust the process and then that voice reminds me you have all the resources in you to deal with anything life puts in your path and then I remember that and then that same spirit says, here, look at all the times that we've been through this together. And look how you've always come through. And then it's after that process that I'm able to let go of the stress and the fears and the anxieties. And just trust that wherever I am, right here and right now, I am with God's spirit. God's spirit is with me. And it's going to be okay. Peace. For me, the peace is the knowing, the experiencing, the Spirit of God. However it happens for you, however it happens for you, there's not a right way, there's not a wrong way. It's just a matter of consciously connecting. And all of us from Missouri know that eventually, as we ask the question, will get the answers that we're seeking. And it may take 27 years to hear the song that I've wanted to hear for worship. But it, I got to hear it, right? I got to hear it. Would you believe in me? Child, you've been running away too long. You're looking for a sign. There ain't no signs to see. It's all right here peace peace to you breathe numa spirit feel can you hear the ac running can you hear it does the ac feel cool on your skin feel it be in the present moment Spirit loves you. Spirit wants you to become whole and complete and become enlightened and conscious. Spirit wants all of this for you. And Spirit will come to you in ways that are not punitive, but rather that are nurturing, and teaching. Peace. Peace be upon all of you. Thus ends the lesson. Amen.